Last time I did speak about forming the ideal crew to go to Mars, and that's been my passion and my interest for several years now, is this idea of sending four, six people on a two to three year round trip to Mars, and what's gonna happen to those people? I think they're gonna go crazy, okay? And that's okay, you can laugh at it, that's okay. I think it's gonna be interesting to see the mixture of men and women and different personalities and how we train those individuals so that they don't go crazy on that flight to Mars. But this time around, I wanna talk about the other part of that, that dynamic there, which is the, the machine side. What is the vehicle that's gonna carry this crew to Mars, and what are they gonna live in once they're there? So I wanna take a moment and mention what human factors the field is all about. Some of you may not have heard of this before, human factors. Certainly even here on here, our campus, they often confuse it with human resources. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. Human factors, uh, as one of my colleagues likes to, to describe, would be if you had engineering and psychology get together and there was an offspring. It's the mixture of the principles of engineering, the theories, with the principles and theories from psychology, and the goal is to improve the interaction between a human, all of us here, and the systems we use. Whether it be a cell phone, your car, an airplane, or in my case, a spaceship. So that's my background, is looking at the entire system, the human element, as well as the machine element, or the spaceship element. This goes back a few years, about 40 years now, to 1973 when America's first, and you could argue only space station, was launched into orbit. I say only space station because the International Space Station is not just the United States alone, it's with our partners in Russia and other countries. But this was America's first space station and it was America's first true green space station. And by that I mean we recycled Skylab from leftover parts from the Apollo program. There were supposed to be Apollo 17, or sorry, 18, 19, and 20. Well, the Nixon administration canceled those flights, canceled those missions toward the end of the Apollo program. So NASA had the vehicles already purchased and bought and paid for and constructed, and some intelligent engineers, engineers at NASA said, well, let's build a space station out of this. That shouldn't have gone there. I'm getting to this point here in a moment. The story doesn't end well for Skylab. We had three flights to Skylab, three three-person crews lived aboard it. Uh, the longest flight was 84 days. My part of the story comes in a few years later when I was about the age that my daughter is now. I have a daughter who uh, loves dinosaurs, and I saw a preview of one of the other talks about cars and dinosaurs. Who's doing that one? She's going to love that one. I was about eight or nine years old, and I kept hearing in the news that Skylab is falling. Ooh, what, what does this mean? This spaceship's falling out of the sky. And sure enough, here's the New York Times article from the day after. Most of Skylab burnt up in the atmosphere, of course, but pieces of it did fall into Australia. Some parts, there are larger parts there. As an eight or nine year old, however, I was trying to be this guy, and I grew up in Colorado. I'm walking around the streets literally looking for pieces of Skylab. I thought they've got to be there. And I'd find weird looking pieces of metal and I'd go show my parents. I said, I think this is the Skylab. <laughs> All right, Jason, just put that in the trash. No, it's Skylab. All right. But what drew me in was this idea that there was this house in space that people lived in. And so I started looking into it a little bit more and more. At that time, we didn't have the internets, we didn't have Google. All right, so you actually had to go and look this up in the newspapers, and uh, it was not easy to do. But I was fascinated by this idea of people living in space and what NASA and the engineers had to design to make that possible. You had to think about not only where people will work, but where they'll live. The Apollo flights, maybe a couple weeks long. Before that, Mercury, Gemini, a few days up to a couple weeks. You could get by with providing oxygen and food to the crews. But now you had to divide, or provide living space. You had to provide a way that the crew can work, conduct their science. But you also had to think about, well, what are they going to eat? We can't have them eating out of the little plastic bags anymore. 
We had to design new food programs and utensils and a way to keep the food on the tray as shown here. I always wanted to eat off a, a plate like that at home. Parents would never get me one. Switches on your dinner, dinner plate, amazing. We also had to think about how we're going to keep clean. Most of us here in the United States, we like to shower once, twice, three times a day, perhaps. Now we're going into space, so we're going to need a fancy shower. What's the problem with showering in space, and why do I say this is the last shower in space? Who's been in, in space? I know we could probably a few of you here. All right. Well, you've seen the astronaut. You've seen the Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield show you what happens to water. Water comes out of a shower head, and where's it going to go? It's just going to stay right there. So you're not showering. You're mainly walking through water and trying to grab water. And you're sealed up in this container. So we learned with Skylab this does not work in terms of keeping the crew clean. And you cut hair in space. You've got to have a vacuum nearby. So we're learning how to do this with Skylab. And it just, as an eight or nine year old, it fascinated me that technology went into this. Plus, they made it out of an old, basically, fuel tank left over from the Apollo program. We had to provide a place for the crew to spend their off duty time. Many of us, at the end of the work day or the school day, we don't want to go and spend the evenings with the people we spent the entire day with. We want some time to ourselves, we want our privacy and personal space. We want a place to call our own. And with Skylab, we started to provide that to the crew. Well, fast forward to 2013, 40 years later, and some engineers at Marshall Space Flight Center are now talking about Skylab 2, using components from the new space launch system that NASA is working on, NASA's new heavy lift capability. So what's exciting to me is this idea that we could have another green space station, one that is built here on Earth, fully assembled, we launch into orbit, and once again, we're tasked with this idea of what should a home in space look like? What do we need to put on board to keep the crew physically healthy as well as mentally healthy? So going back to the Skylab model, you take a fuel tank, how do we parse up that space so that a crew of four or six can work productively, work safely. And my side of the psychology, the behavioral side of it is, I want them to enjoy the experience. It shouldn't feel like they're trapped. It shouldn't feel like they're in the older space stations. And I'll show a couple of photos here in a moment of the Mir space station, which was like a torture chamber. Very messy, very dangerous. So this was the question that I brought to my students this semester. What should a house in space look like? Not what have they looked like before, or what we think we can do because it has to look like the Skylab or the International Space Station, but what should it look like as we move forward? We may go back to the moon. We may go capture an asteroid. But one plan that has been consistent over the different administrations is that we're going to go to Mars. And it's always about 20 years out. So we got it to about 2030. Hopefully my daughter will be ready to go. Uh, she loves the dinosaurs, though, and she's, you know, so she's going to be the first astronaut paleontologist, is what she's told me. But I want to build her something that keeps her happy on the way there, keeps her healthy. So this is what I brought. The question I brought to my students was, how should we build a house in space? Now, the problem is we don't have a spaceship here at Emory-Riddle. And if you go down to NASA headquarters or Johnson Space Center, they're probably not going to let you borrow and take a spin in some of their space vehicles. So the idea was, let's go buy something that we can convert. Or not me. I don't do any of the work, by the way. I get all the credit because I'm up here and I had the nice introduction, but I don't do any of the work. In fact, some of my students who are here in the audience, they're the ones that have spent their summer reconfiguring this. Well, let me ask all of you, what already looks like a spaceship? Something we could buy. A tray. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you the 20 bucks later. A trailer. All right? Oh, before we get there, here we go. Going back to this idea of what should a spaceship look like. Some of you might remember the Collier's Magazine article from the 1950s. And this was a series of drawings about what the future of space would look like. 
Got a lot of people excited about the future. In fact, the, the headline was, this is what we're going to conquer space soon. Well, that was 1952. We're not quite there. But Collier's had all these ideas about what it could look like. Putting together life support, putting together places for families to live together. Of course, we have examples from, this is the Russian space station Mir. Imagine spending six months inside of that. This is the space shuttle mid-deck. Not a lot of room, but you only spent a couple of weeks in the space shuttle. And then, of course, we have the International Space Station. Crews are living aboard that and have been living aboard the space station for the past 11 years. Not a lot of people in our country even recognize that or are aware of that. I think we can do better than design that. So the question then became, what can we take from previous space stations and let's build a house here on Earth right here on campus, and do it in a way that the students can get hands-on experience. So we went out and we bought a trailer. 1976 Airstream International 31-foot trailer. All right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I heard someone whistle. We got a pretty good price on it, because you should have seen the interior of this thing when we got it. My project manager on this effort, what we're called MIRS, and I'll explain that in a moment, uh, is Mike Failinger. And he and I were discussing, you know, what should we buy, what should we get? And we went back and we thought, you know, NASA's already used the Airstream trailers before. When the first crew, Neil Buzz and Mike Collins, went to the moon and came back, the medical personnel back at, at Johnson Space Center thought, well, they're probably going to bring back some bugs, some moon viruses. We've got to lock them up and isolate them. And so they tasked Airstream with coming up with what was called the mobile quarantine facility. And if you've seen this famous photo of Richard Nixon talking to the moon crew, they're inside the Airstream. So I thought, well, that's cool. We can get an Airstream trailer. Let's go find one. So there's Mike on the left. There's me on the right in my blue shirt again. All right. He went out and found this Airstream trailer, found a pretty good price on it, and we convinced some people on campus to give us a little bit of money to buy this. When it arrived, I said, oh, no. I went inside. It had that 1976 odor to it. And the interior decor was 1976. But we spent the summer removing all the old to prepare for the new. Again, here in the lower right here, that's me pretending to do any work. I took a lot of photos. We had a lot of challenges. We had this interior plastic covering on the walls that we couldn't scrape off easily, so we had to get this chemical that made it peel away, and the chemical was, was not good to breathe in. It was hot. We had no AC in this at this time. So we spent the summer getting this trailer ready so that in the fall, my students can start working on it. Another key part of this was to make it look good. One goal is that we take this trailer, the mirrors, out to high schools and let the students get inside and think about, how would I design this space? How could I improve on what these college, these fancy college students have come up with? Some preliminary drawings about how we'd parse up that space so that everybody has a place to sleep, everybody has a place to do their work, So a couple examples of what MIRS is all about. We call it the Mobile Extreme Environment Research Station. And we have many goals for this. My ultimate goal is that when this thing's functional, I can lock people up in it, okay, and see what happens. You know, say, oh, well, we'll let you out in a minute, and you lock the door, and they come out two weeks later, and they're, they're kind of looking like this. That's what I want to see. And I want to see who's going to go crazy first. What personality type will go crazy first? Because we need to understand this if we're going to select the crew to go to Mars. But I don't tell my students this. It makes them a little nervous. The project, though, is, is much larger than that. In a lot of our human factors courses here on campus, we, we think about the best way to design something, the, the cockpit for an aircraft or a spaceship. But students don't get the opportunity to do hands-on work. I wanted them to have something that they could go inside and tear down the walls and build it back up the right way. So we are looking at 
technology for space flight. We're also looking at how do we design an environment, a house that is sustainable, that relies on solar power, that recycles water. How many of you are aware that currently aboard the International Space Station, the crew drink their own urine? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You guys must be fun at parties. You know the <laughs> great group. They do drink their own urine. And think about it, we can't take all the water, drinking water we need to go to Mars. So we have to find ways to reclaim that water. We also can't take all the food we possibly are going to be able to need to go to Mars. So we need to find ways to grow our own food on the way to Mars. And so we have technologies using aeroponics and aquaponics. So I wanted an opportunity for students to have hands-on to be able to do these types of projects. We have students from uh, several different disciplines here on campus. Human factors, we have aerospace engineers, we have some from aviation maintenance science because they have the, the tools, not only mentally but physically, to convert this station. Oh, let me go back up here. Some of you here on campus are aware of Project Arapaima, which is a, a student-led project to design and launch a CubeSat or satellite and we've partnered with them to provide their mission control center here on Earth. So when they launch the satellite, they can be used mirrors as a mobile mission control platform. Well, right now, MIRS is located just off campus near the Larson Motorsports. And if any of you uh, would like to see it, we, we took the floor out of it recently and realized that uh, we have to do some work on the water tanks. But it is located nearby. And my goal eventually is that this thing will be truly mobile. We tow this out to the Utah desert, and we simulate a Mars mission. We tow it to a local high school, and we say, why don't you guys go in it for a couple hours, and we'll simulate a little space mission. So it's a way to outreach and to encourage interest in science, technology, engineering, and math. This project, when I, when I bring it up to my colleagues, I, I often get that look. And it's the look that you give someone when they, um, they wear some new outfit, and it just doesn't really work. But you won't want to be mean, so you give that look. Right? So what are you doing? Well, I bought an Airstream trailer. I'm going to make it into a spaceship. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're not going to bring it on campus. Oh, yeah, I'll bring it on campus. We did one day, and people said, is, is that a trailer parked over there? I think some people thought that it was just some random person parked their trailer on campus. So I get that look, and I understand the hesitation. It seems crazy, buy an old RV and convert it into a spaceship. But the reason, the why, is to give my students the opportunity to work on a real project. I want them working together, and we've already found this out, that you've got the group of students from Human Factors working with aerospace engineers, and they do come to the table with different perspectives. Engineers want hard numbers. Human factors people are more about, well, let's think about the overall design. And watching them come together has been fascinating this semester. I've tried to provide some strict guidelines to make this a project that would be like the real world project. And then finally, the idea is that once this is, is functional, students can take this out and conduct science in applied settings. Here's are some of the areas that we're working on this fall. As I mentioned, I have projects or student teams that are focused on each of these. And already they've come up with some brilliant ways to provide the crew each of these capabilities within mirrors. We have a minimal budget. So I tell them, find ways that we can borrow, steal, not steal, but go to a junkyard perhaps. So we can have this working by the end of the semester. Show you just some of the photos. This is our aeroponics device that Sam Patel, who's the gentleman there, has designed. This uses uh, a fertilized water mist to grow plants, so you don't have to bring soil on board. Of course, the benefit of plants is that they'll scrub the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere while also providing something the crew to eat. So we, we will be working on that this semester. This is the uh, group of students inside the mirrors after we've gutted it and got it down to that bare shell. 
Here they are working really hard in class or at least posing for a photo. So there's our trailer. There's the students there. And for me, the, the joy is seeing students get excited about something, even though it is a, a trailer. They're, they're converting a trailer. But it's something that I think provides the opportunity for students to have hands-on experience and designing technologies that will allow us to go back to the moon and to Mars one day. And with that, I believe I will stop. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.